and chased them, and during that time, Green's army got bigger and bigger, while, How while Cornwallis's army got smaller and smaller and smaller. Finally, General Cornwallis realized he'd been hoodwinked, so he started to retreat. He got to a place in Virginia called Yorktown. But before we go into Yorktown, I want to digress a little bit to something that happened that really hurt the Colonials. Benedict Arnold was one of the best soldiers that Washington had. But unfortunately, he married a woman who was the daughter of a British appointed judge, and she was highly sympathetic to the British. Arnold was um, court martial for his business dealings. He made himself rich from uh, the war. A lot of people can take advantage of bad times for others and fatten their own pockets. Um, then he was passed over for promotion. Arnold was really upset when the Congress court-martialed him, but he was acquitted of most of the charges, except for one charge, and George Washington was ordered to reprimand him. Washington reprimanded him in the mildest of tones. But then, when it came time for promotion, now folk, let me tell you something about the business being passed over for promotion. There was a general, no, he was a colonel in the Swiss Army one time, and uh, he was hard against the communist, but one day he got passed over for promotion and when he, he was so upset that he gave a secret to the Russians and after that the Russians owned him. He would keep giving secrets and secrets away. Well he, were, he started to make up for his moral fail, failure by working harder. He eventually got promoted to general, then he got promoted to major general, then he got caught and spent the rest of his life in prison. When I was at Lockheed he was training, he said that these spies know who's been passed over promotion. If you get passed over promotion in the workplace, they might start approaching you and get really, really friendly with you. Hopefully all of you are hearing me. And might get you to, in a moment of weakness, reveal some secret, and then after that, they own you. You know that if you don't keep giving them more secrets, they're going to tell on you. They're going to report you. Anyway, Arnold was passed over promotion. <coughs> And at that point, General uh, Arnold went to General Clinton and said, hey, I'll give you West Point, and also I can guarantee that you'll win a battle because I am going to give you my, the American plans. I mean, Arnold had access to General Washington's plans. Clinton hesitated, but finally he sent Major Andre. Major Andre was caught on the way. Three men stopped him to rob him. They were, they, were, they were loyal Americans, but they were so poor they felt like they had to rob. And they found this well-dressed man, and they, hey, they were going to rob. But they found some papers on him, and one of the men could read. So this man took Andre and reported him to, to, well, reported him to the Continental Army. Andre was hanged. As for Arnold himself, some private who did not know any better went to Arnold's house and admitted <laughs> Mr. Arnold, uh, they've captured Major Andre, and Major Andre was working to try to get um, West Point given over to the British. Ar oh, Arnold didn't know that he was the man that they were after. Arnold quickly got on his horse and galloped off, and just as Arnold was leaving, some Continental soldiers came on foot to capture him. Arnold saw them, they saw him, but they were on foot, he was on a horse. Arnold galloped off behind the British lines. From that day to this, the name Benedict Arnold has gone next to the name Judas Iscariot. Arnold found out to the British and did not like him, and he wound up late in life becoming demented. Um, he was never able to return to his country. People don't like a person who betrayed their own country. Um, South Carolina then, whom uh, Cornwallis thought was loyal, erupted into guerrilla warfare. Your book doesn't mention him, but at one time the General Francis Marion was mentioned. Francis Marion was called the Swamp Fox. He would live in the swamps. He and his men would come out of the swamps, kill a bunch of Britishers, and then flee the swamps. Come out, uh, kill a bunch. It was guerrilla warfare, very dirty way to fight war. Um, Cornwallis went to Virginia. He initially got the upper hand, but then finally, 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 the French fleet showed up. 
There was a movie made called The Patriot, made about 20 years ago, and it said the long-awaited help from the French finally arrived. The French fleet showed up, and they got to Rhode Island. George Washington and his men got on board the French ships and started heading south. In the meantime, General Howe, no, General Clinton, or General Clinton up in New York did not know where Washington had gone. But um, now General Cornwallis began to send General Howe a bunch of letters, which we have a copy of, and finally said, Mr. General Howe, <clears throat> I'm desperate here. And General Howe replied, I'm going to come to your aid. Just wait. I'm coming to your aid. If Cornwallis would have left Yorktown right away, he could have escaped. Yorktown is like on a peninsula. Well, the French were here, and they had a British, bunch of British ships here. But the French fleet was very large. Well, in the meantime, here was Cornwallis. He could have gotten away. But George Washington eventually came with Lafayette and, uh, and, uh, and uh, all of Anthony Wayne and a whole bunch of other generals, and eventually they completely surrounded Cornwallis. Cornwallis' last letter to Howe said, My situation is desperate. Washington and his men had some 16,000 men. Cornwallis only had some 7,500 7, men. Finally, Cornwallis called for surrender. He and Washington met. The British fleet sitting out here was allowed to come in and take the British soldiers home. The British <clears throat> marching up in a certain drumbeat, all the British soldiers threw their rifles down. I mean, that was part of warfare in those days. <clears throat> the British had to leave behind all their ammunition, but the soldiers themselves got to get on board the British ships and head home. There's a rumor going around that the British drummer was playing the world's turned upside down. Anyway, this was the last battle of the war. General Clinton finally arrived five days later, but he didn't have enough of an army left to take on Washington and the French and the French Navy and whatever, so there was no fighting. In the meantime, with the surrender occurring in October 1781, Almost two years later, September 2nd, 1783, the Treaty of Paris was signed. The Treaty of Paris recognized colonial independence and the colonial territory went all the way to the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. It included a whole lot of territory that uh, had not been part of the original, including the states of Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky. Kentucky, thanks to Daniel Boone. Ohio and Indiana and Illinois and Michigan and Wisconsin, thanks to George Rogers Clark. The, the Colonials had won the battles west of the Appalachians. So they, uh, anyway, there are two treaties of Paris. The one ended the French and Indian War, the other one ended the Revolutionary War. All right. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were both sent to Paris to help negotiate the treaty. Both men became president of the United States. All right, move on to chapter seven. Chapter eight, pardon me, chapter eight. Building a new nation, building a republic. Um, James Madison was our fourth president, and yes, I went to a high school, Madison High School, named after him. Anyway, he became a revolutionary when he heard about the closing of the Port of Boston. He's the one who wrote the Constitution. Uh, he is, therefore, he's remembered as the father of the Constitution. Our first attempt at government after the uh, war is called the Articles Confederation. The Articles Confederation is what we fought the war with. It lasted 10 years. 
It failed because it could not tax, could not enforce treaties. They raised their money by selling land in the territory they'd gotten from the British. You know, where they'd sell land in Ohio, sell land in what's today, Indiana and Illinois. And they raised money by selling that land that nobody owned but the Indians, but that didn't count in those days. There was no president and there was no judiciary. It was just a Congress would meet, and a lot of times it was so unimportant that most of the congressmen wouldn't even show up. Government officials came and went. They were expected to work at their businesses and do government service every once in a while. That was the articles for you. Each state had only one vote. Seventy states would approve, and most of it required just seven states to approve, and it didn't matter the size of the states. The more important decisions required nine states to agree. To amend the articles, every one of the states had to agree. Keep that in mind because to adopt the Constitution, all the states had to agree to do it. Well, the requirement for unanimity hamstrung the government. Poland tried this, spoke, and uh, I've often wondered. I mean, we require unanimity when we make a jury decision, 12 persons and it's sometimes very difficult to get all 12 to agree and I've often wondered should they just require a 10 to 2 vote or a 9 to 3 vote but anyway unanimity Poland for a while required all the nobles agree before they made a new law and the result was Poland got divided between Russia, Germany and Austria um, Anyway, some of the lands, some states, Virginia, Massachusetts, Connecticut, North Carolina, and South Carolina, and Georgia, claimed lands west of, Mass west of the Appalachians. New Hampshire had also land that was claimed by Massachusetts, New York, and New Hampshire. Um, five of the states did not have western land claims. Eventually, all the states that had western land claims, and I mean for western land claims, these states claim territory in this region right here. Eventually, all of them were persuaded to give it up. Like Virginia once claimed all this territory here, and eventually they were persuaded to give it up. Um, and um, Georgia, Georgia claimed territory, what is today part of Alabama and part of Mississippi. They were eventually persuaded to give it up. And uh, all these states that had territory west of the Appalachians were eventually persuaded to give up their land claims. This will be very important later and it explains why we have separate states. All right. Uh, after 10 years, a bunch of people decided to get together and draw up a constitution uh, the Constitution we have today. Um, now, again, I'm going to spend some time dealing with this. The Constitution begins with a preamble called We the People of the United States in order to uh, ensure domestic tranquility, form a more perfect union, and again, when I was 13 years old, we're expected to memorize a preamble. Today, I can't quite quote it, but Essentially, it says that we've decided to get together and form a better union than one we've had. It's called a bundle of compromises. James Madison was, as much as anyone was the author, was the author. Uh, they decided that the states with more people should have more say than the states with fewer people. States, in other words, like New York, should have more of a say so than Georgia, for instance. Georgia did not have many people in it. Now, slavery. Should slaves count for taxation purposes and representation purposes? The North said, hey, states should, I mean, the slaves should either count for both or not at all. In other words, if you're going to count slaves for representation purposes, you should count for taxing. The South said, oh, no, we want to count them for representation, but not for taxing. So they finally worked out a compromise where the slave was considered three-fifths of a person, called the infamous three-fifths compromise that every uh, five slaves had like counted three times for representation and taxation purposes. Uh, slave, the word slave is not used. Instead, slaves are called 
such persons or other persons. Now, they were going by John Locke's idea of a separation of powers. They said we might need to have three branches of government. One branch will consist of one man at the head. The other branch will consist of elected representatives of two houses, a house and the Senate. And then there'll be a judiciary. Senators were to be chosen two from each state. The number of representatives was to be 435 proportioned among the states with the, most, the least popular states having fewer and the most popular states having more. The president was to be chosen by a body called the Electoral College. Now, folks, this is still a hot, it's been a hot issue ever since the beginning. The idea of the Electoral College goes, now this is something nobody's going to tell you, but it goes back to the uh, uh, Templars. The Templars had a case situation where they said, the best of us would choose a few people, and then those people would choose the best of those people, and then those people could then choose our leader. You know, only the best few would vote. Um, the Catholic Church has something like this in the way of choosing a pope. Only the cardinals vote to, for who the pope is. No one else, so only the College of Cardinals. So, you know, the priests don't have a say so, the bishops don't, the archbishops don't, it's only the cardinals. And in Germany, they had something like this, where the higher nobility would elect a Holy Roman Emperor. No one else could vote except for the electors. The elector of this, the elector of that. Only the highest nobility could pick the emperor. Uh, so th this was now what they had. Uh, now, they wanted to make sure the president was a good person, a good man. So they only allowed the more successful people to vote. You know, to vote in the colonies, you had to be a property owner. Now, later it was decided, well, hey, wait a minute now. What about a person who's actually rich, but he's a banker and has no property, or a person who's a tanner or has no property? But uh, so, it, but at first, the nation was mostly a nation of farmers, and only property owners could vote. This was still in state constitutions as recently as when my dad was a young man in the 1920s and 30s. In some states, only property owners could serve on jurors, juries, even though they all could, even non-property owners could vote, but. Uh, they only allowed property owners to serve on juries or so on in some states. But only the property owners were allowed to vote. Um, and only men could vote. Um, all this was eventually, of course, to be changed. Um, Again, they felt threatened by having a lot of power in the hands of one man, but then they decided that the president would only serve for four years. They never specified whether or not he could be reelected or how many terms. Now later that was changed to where a president can only serve eight years and then he's not allowed to run again. Um, but anyway, the president was elected to a term of four years. He could veto laws passed by Congress, but he could not make laws. Now that's been amended somewhat too. Okay, if I'm confusing you folks, it's because so many changes have gone in the last 230 or so years since the Constitution was adopted. And um, what was so true then is not necessarily true now. But two senators from every state, two representatives, they take the number 435 and divide it up with the, some states getting more and some states getting less. Two houses. All right. Now, um, most of your state constitutions had a Bill of Rights. Or actually, six of the 13, that was less than half, had a Bill of Rights. The property qualification was rarely questioned those days. Northern states began to free slaves. States of the South, Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, slavery was too entrenched, and they could not free them. It took us to take a long war uh, to get the slaves free. George Washington had in his will that when he and his wife were both gone, they had no children, their slaves would be freed. When George Washington died before his wife did, when his wife died, his slaves were freed. 
Um, again, the South was very heavily dependent on slave labor. All right. Now, the economy had fluctuated wildly during the war. The Congress had issued paper money and its value would vary greatly depending on how many people believed in it. Then, the war ended and the country experienced several years of depression. The Congress found itself in financial troubles. They called on a rich banker, Robert Morris. Now, this was to happen several times later in history. Grover Cleveland called on a rich financier, J.P. Morgan, about a century later. But uh, Morris proposed an import tax, a tax on imports. All 13 states had to ratify the tax. One would not do so if the tax were not passed. Now, this tax on imports, folks, is going to become important later. It's called a tariff. When I was in high school, we took an achievement test, and one of the questions I'll never forget, the one issue that has been bothering every administration from Washington's to the present, but actually it was bothering even before Washington, was, is the tariff. Today, President Trump is facing a big issue with the tariff because we've been trading for years with countries who will put a high tariff on our goods and expect us to keep a tariff on their goods low. I mean, we got the actual figures. Trump says this is unfair, and uh, he wants to correct it. But anyway, in import tax, it's another way of saying tariff. Morris then proposed a bank. They set up the Bank of North America. It did little to relieve the central government's problems, but Morris profited from it personally. The power of the government was so little that the, the economic problems could not be solved. Well, eventually Virginia gave up its western land claims and the government was able to sell these lands, lands in Kentucky and uh, places up in Ohio, places Virginia claimed. This territory up here was called the Northwest Territory. I mean, I'm talking about what's Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan. Five states were to be carved out of it. Northwest Territory. Um, the land was to be sold. Everybody who bought had to buy 640 acres at a dollar an acre. But $640 was more money than most people had, considering that wages were about a dollar a day. That was like two years, three years wages. The best land could be sold for even more than that. Most of the people who bought it were wealthy speculators who intended to buy it and sell it at a profit, which really hurt the other, the common people too because they couldn't buy it at a dollar an acre. The Indians were ignored. The Indians were to fight for 20 years before finally the Indians capitulated. Um, we'll talk a little more about the Indian Wars in a little bit. Interestingly enough, slavery was forbidden in the Northwest Territory. And even Thomas Jefferson agreed with it. I think the hope was among the Southerners, who had not become hardened to it yet, um, that the hope was that eventually slavery would become unnecessary and they would eventually be able to free their slaves. And uh, that was a hope at least temporarily. Now later we'll find out that they decided, no, we're not going to free our slaves. All right. Shays' Rebellion, the main thing I remember about Shays' Rebellion was the man named Daniel Shays led a rebellion that showed how weak the central government was. And um, it's let the rich people know that, hey, the government is just not strong enough to support you. The government is not strong enough to protect you. Um, Shays was concerned about taxes. We had fought a war of largely over taxes, and now we we kind of hey we still have to pay taxes, even uh, even though we're paying taxes to our own government, we're still paying taxes. 
the Shays Rebellion was put down, but a lot of citizens had their rights taken away. The new government seemed powerless. So then they finally met to form a constitution. We're going to spend the next time talking about the constitution. Um, George Washington presided over the Constitutional Convention. We even know he hardly said anything, but he let uh, other men, particularly Madison and Jefferson, debate it, set it up. Ben Franklin was there. Alexander Hamilton was there also. Madison, Franklin, Hamilton. Uh, these men did a lot to shape the nation's future, write up the Constitution. Separation of powers to help guarantee that one branch of government would not be um, too strong over the others. Now, most of the delegates were young. Most of them were pro well, they all were all property owners. Um, they met in secrecy, and that way they could more easily change their minds without being accused of betraying people who thought they were taking one side of an issue. And also their honest opinions would be less likely to come back to haunt them later. So they met in secrecy. They um, discussed their thing, what they were discussing in secrecy. And again, that made it more likely that they could, would be able to change their minds without hurting themselves. For a while, they could get nowhere. Now, this is not in your book that I know of, but it's in some other books. But uh, the, de the delegation was deadlocked till the middle of July. One group had a plan called the New Jersey Plan, gave each state one vote, but at least the central government would be over the states. Another said that the smaller states would have less vote than the weaker states. The uh, Virginia delegate, the Virginia plan. Eventually, they, they compromised, and uh, they had a House of Representatives that was based on on population. The Senate, each state sends two senators to Washington. But when things got really, really hot, Ben Franklin stood up and said, "Now, folk, we're getting nowhere. Let's stop. Call in a chaplain. Let's have a prayer time." They did, and all of a sudden, things began to smooth out. The sides that could not agree. They gave, each side gave in a little bit. It's called the bundle of compromises. And compromise became the order of the day. This have already been over. Now, um, these men studied Greek democracy and they studied Roman, Roman Republic. And they came to an interesting conclusion Democracy has a tendency to fail, and it eventually is taken over. Now, um, we're going to talk more about this later, but I want to say this. Somebody, and nobody to this day knows who said it, but some philosopher said, the American system of democracy will work until the common people find they can dip their hand in the public pot and pull out the public money. Okay. Um, so they, they decided they did not want democracy. Our government is now called a republic, similar to Roman times. Not a democracy, because that was viewed on as being dangerous. Part of it, they, I mean, okay, our founding fathers felt like the ordinary person did not understand government well enough to participate in it, so they only wanted the best, the most intelligent, the most enlightened people to actually participate. 